Okay, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Nah, I'm okay, okay, I'll just go read it. All right, our speaker is uh, Dr. Maria Theodoro. Uh, Maria has been at the Moorfields Eye Hospital London since 2012 as a consultant ophthalmologist in pediatrics and strabismus and an honorary consultant at the Great Ormond Street Hospital where she trained as a research and clinical fellow. She completed a PhD at the Institute of Child Health at Great Ormond Street Hospital, which involved writing a novel computer program uh, to, uh, to analyze nystagmus waveforms. The main focus of her research is looking at the development of visual function in infantile nystagmus, the effects of infantile nystagmus on visual function and potential treatments for nystagmus, as well as the application of eye movements in the clinical setting. Her clinical focus is on optimizing both visual function by optical, medical, and surgical means, and by improving awareness and quality of life. Maria is primarily a clinician, and so she always aims to apply her own and others' research in real life setting to maximize the benefit to children and adults with nystagmus. So please welcome Maria Theodoro. Right, thank you, um, and thank you for the introduction. So, um, as Joe said, my name's Maria, and I'm um, primarily a clinician, which means that I spend most of my time in clinics with children um, with general ophthalmology problems, nystagmus, strabismus, as well as adults with um, strabismus and, um, and nystagmus. So, um, and I'm glad that there are a few people here and everyone hasn't gone over to Jay's talk. It's quite <laughs> difficult competing with genetics this morning. Um, so thank you for those of you that have come to my talk. So I, um, the focus is mainly on optical interventions, and it's not quite as um, exciting and sexy as genetics. Um, I've taken, um, I've written this talk from a pediatric ophthalmology point of view. Um, so it really is the bread and butter of pediatric ophthalmology nystagmus. So we know that nystagmus can be isolated or can occur as part of a, an ocular or neurological disorder. Um, the prevalence in the UK is about 0.24%, um, which is all groups of nystagmus, but infantile nystagmus, so the congenital nystagmus, is about 0.14%. In the UK, the population, it's probably more than this now, um, is about 65 million, so there are over 155,000 people with nystagmus. Not that uncommon. And as you know, it's associated with reduced visual function, intermittent or constant oscillopsia, um, although in infantile it's more intermittent, um, and we know that it has a detrimental effect on psychological well-being. So my typical clinic scenario um, is many adults with nystagmus were told that they were going to be blind in infancy, um, and it actually still happens even in this day and age. Um, so I see older children, and they've been seen by others and told that the children won't be able to see um, Many, um, many people return to clinics as adults um, with or without their children looking for what we can offer as treatment options. Um, or they come with newly diagnosed infants and children without a definite family history and they have no idea what to expect or even if the child can see. Now, although I'm talking about treatments, um, we manage things slightly differently in, in the UK in that before we even go down the treatment route, we actually like to find out, if we can, what the cause of nystagmus is, because this has implications in terms of future children, visual prognosis, how, how they'll be treated in future, because the um, research going on, you probably heard many of the talks yesterday, um, the treatments are changing and are going to be very, maybe gene-specific, maybe diagnosis-specific. So it's quite Im important to manage the patients as a whole, to investigate first, and then think about treatment options. Um, anyway, so back to treatments. Um, to date, there are only five published randomized trials looking at treatments, one on biofeedback, one on gabapentin and romantine, two on contact lenses, and one on brinzolamide eye drops. The other thing we don't know is when is the best time to offer treatments. So there is no gold standard for treatments. Most evidence is limited to case reports and case series and people's own experience. We still aren't sure how best to measure the effects of treatment. In the clinical setting, um, I don't know what clinics are like here, but in the UK, they're crazy, overbooked, very busy clinics. Um, but still, our gold standard is, is a black and white um, vision chart. It's not the best me measure of visual function. We know that, but at the moment, that's what we have in the clinical setting. 
Um, so at present, we essentially manage the ambiopia, um, and then we then think about whether dampening the nystagmus overall or exploit, exploiting a null zone will help. Treatments can generally be split into optical, medical, and surgical. The focus is mostly going to be on optical and less on medical because that's a whole other talk in itself. So I'm just going to talk about a couple of things, medical things that are used more commonly. A couple of examples of cases that I'll see in clinic. Um, so this is, for example, a six-year-old in my, in my clinic who has con idiopathic congenital nystagmus, also has a squint, which, as many of you know, is much more common if you have nystagmus. Um, but the quint squint is mostly correctable with glasses. She also has a latent element to her nystagmus, which means that as soon as you cover one eye, um, the other eye starts wobbling much, much more. Um, and this is common in children that have had early loss of binocular vision, i.e. not being able to use the eyes together. And she has a lazy left eye because of the, um, the squint and difference in glasses prescription. This child actually is the, the most suitable treatment options for her were actually completely optical, so full-time spectacle wear. Um, she then needed a four-month period of refractive adaptation to give her brain time to get used to the glasses and the vision to develop. And then she was given atropine drops to her good eye to force the brain to use the left eye. Um, so many children are managed purely by optical means. And this is just another example of a 16-year-old who, um, these are her eye recordings, she used a left face turn to utilize the null in right gaze. Again, when I'm managing children and even adults, I go down the optical route first. Um, refractive correction, she didn't have a significant refractive error. So then we go into the next, do we dampen the nystagmus overall? or do we work with the null zone? Um, in, this, in this child, she actually had surgery, so. So in terms of optical treatments, um, the, main, the main thing I'm going to talk about is correction of refractive error. Our last speaker this morning, it was really nice of her to mention, um, really just before my talk, about how, uh, what a difference glasses made to her at the age of four. People always underestimate the effect of correcting the refractive error. It's really important, and it isn't, um, I haven't highlighted it in bold um, for no reason. It is the single most important part of treating, managing nystagmus um, in children as well as adults. Other things, optical devices that negate the effects of nystagmus, more so in acquired nystagmus, my focus is going to be on infantile nystagmus as they make up the majority of my patients. Um, biofeedback, prisms, and contact lens wear um, I was thinking of it as a proprioceptive effect. That's why I put it down twice. I wasn't half asleep. <laughs> so um, now this is following on from um, Helena's analogy. We need to start with the basics, and I can't stress this enough. It's so important. You have to get the basic, you know, if you're making a cake, you have to get the basic ingredients right before you can do something fancy. So we need to treat the children and adults with optical management, and the timing is also important, which I'm going to discuss in a second. And then once you've got a good baseline, so you've got your nice Victoria sponge, then you can think about adding all the fancy stuff later on, which in nystagmus is the medical treatments and all the surgical treatments. But you can't go from, uh, you can't skip out the basics before you go into something more fancy. So back to refractive error. I know you're going to get sick of hearing this, but it's so important. Refractive error is basically long-sightedness, short-sightedness, plus or minus astigmatism. Very, very common in children and adults with, with nystagmus. And as I've said, not just in nystagmus, but generally as a pediatric ophthalmologist, it's the single most important part in managing infantile nystagmus. The amblyogenic period, which is the period where you're, um, where you're at high risk of developing a lazy eye because the visual system is still developing, is up to approximately eight. It's not a strict cutoff. You don't, when you turn eight, you don't, then so, the vision doesn't suddenly stop improvement, improving, which is what many, um, many people think. It's not a strict cutoff, but you get most of your improvement before the age of eight. Um, there have been some reports of improvement beyond this, and even in adults, um, but you tend to get the maximum um, benefit during this period. So if there is any significant refractive error, long sight and short sight astigmatism, they need to be, it needs to be corrected as early on as possible. Um, and in children especially, um, correcting the refractive error also often corrects the squint. Many children with an inward turning eye have a long sighted um, 
a long sighted refractive error, and once you correct that, then it often partially or fully corrects the squint. So, myopia and hyperopia. Myopia is basically a fancy word for short sightedness, where essentially the, um, the light rays are over focused, um, and you can imagine if you're, if you're short sighted um, as the eye and the eye light rays are over-focused as you get older and the eye grows, the short-sightedness is going to be, is going to be worse. Um, and so the lenses used to correct that essentially push the light rays out. Hyperopia is long-sightedness, which is much more common in kids, as you would expect in smaller eyes, um, where the light is essentially under-focused. Um, and so the lenses push the light, light rays in so they're focused on the back of the eye. And because of the growth of the eye, um, children often become less long-sighted as they get older. So I'm going to talk about visual development as well, because it's not just correcting the vision, but also the timing of correcting the vision needs to be done as early as possible. So this is quite a busy slide, but essentially the greatest development in visual acuity is quite early on. You can see this bit, this part of the curve here. So in the first one, two, three years, um, and then it slows down and plateaus after that. In terms of binocular vision, so in terms of learning to use the eyes together, um, you often have gross stereo as a toddler. Um, if you have a squint from early on in childhood, as was mentioned yesterday, one of the mums had um, spoken about, I don't know if she's, she's here, spoken about her child not being able to see the steps, um, but this was more because of the early onset squint. Um, regardless of when you treat when you treat, you're very rarely able to get high-grade stereo, regardless of when you treat. So the eyes then look like they're working together, but they still aren't working together. Um, children that have strabismus later on may be able to regain stereo vision, so using the eyes together. But so this, this is an important part of the curve. So how does this differ in children with infantile nystagmus? Well, this is something that we're looking at at the moment. Some of the work has been analyzed and other work is in progress. Um, but for me, it's quite important because I see so many children with, um, with nystagmus um, and parents want to know what to expect. Um, so this was a small study where we looked at nine infants with infantile nystagmus and we followed them up um, four to six monthly. And each, each, um, each diamond represents a child and the lines are at separate visits. The red is roughly normal vision, and you can see here um, that in the line of approximate best fit, vision development in children, and these are all idiopaths, so children without any other reason for the nystagmus, seems to lag behind normals by approximately six months. So the vision development is delayed, um, but it does get better. So often if parents have other siblings, what they notice is that the child is taking longer to fix what you've probably noticed in your own children, it's taking longer to fix and follow, longer to see things than their older siblings were, um, but it does lag behind by a few months. And then it seems to plateau, um, seems to follow normal vision development by maybe two or three years. We've also, here's just a small section of our, um, of our other study where we've basically looked at all children seen at Moorfields over a 10-year period, um, and a very hard-working junior doctor has done this for me and had a look at every clinic visit and taken, taken notes um, of about 100, 100 children um, over that period. And the, the development, vision development curves are quite similar. Um, the shape is very similar, but it differs slightly for different, for different conditions in that the lag is sli maybe slightly greater for other, for other conditions with another reason for having nystagmus, um, and they plateau at a slightly higher, higher level, so the vision, the final vision isn't quite as good. I mean, the main reason for doing these studies is really to try and see if we can find out, work out when is the optimum period for giving treatment, um, and it, we think it's probably in the first one to two years, which is in line with the development of visual acuity, um, and if we give treatments, even if it's glasses, in the first, uh, really early on, can we enhance the development of the foveation, so the part of the, um, the flatter part of the waveform, and therefore improve final visual acuity? People actually have previously recommended treatment for the age of two, 
um, but it's really difficult to differentiate natural improvements um, with and without intervention. And we don't know what the effect of treatment is beyond the age of two. It's, it's unclear. So still many questions to be answered. Um, we've been doing some work which we're just analysing um, which we're just analysing at the moment. Um, but I know I'm banging on about this, but why is this so important? Because if we go back to basics, we need to get the basics right, the treatment, and when to give the treatment. Um, and if you can catch children early on um, and push treatments, refractive treatment early on, then it does make a difference, a huge difference later on. So how do we correct um, refractive errors? Spets calls, we all know about spets calls are um, commonly used. Contact lenses, um, we don't perform refractive surgery in children. Um, there have been some papers, but it's not generally not recommended below the age of 21 because you essentially would be operating on a moving target. But correcting um, a refractive correction does require persistence and patience. Children are also very different to adults in that because the visual system is still developing. In adults, you'll go to the optician, you put on a pair of glasses, and you'll notice an improvement immediately. In children, it, it's not quite the same. The visual system is still developing, um, and so they won't get they may not get that Im immediate improvement. Um, it takes four months, approximately, of refractive adaptation for the visual system to develop, essentially for the visual system and brain to get used to the glasses. And during that time, you need to find ways of trying to get these children into glasses, even if it means buying a plain pair of glasses yourselves so that children can copy mommy and daddy. Um, it can take up to a year of refractive adaptation in those children with much larger refractive errors. Um, once they've settled into their glasses or contact lenses or whatever means you use to correct the refractive error, you then may need to consider amblyopia therapy, which is commonly patching of one eye, which is patching of the good eye to force the brain to use the bad eye. Um, and or atropine penalization, where you use drops in the, um, in the good eye to force the brain to use the, the bad eye, or even both. Which then goes back to this case where the management was op purely optical in this child who did, who did very well. So glasses, are, we all know about glasses. There's a lot of evidence for spectacle wear. Um, it's the bread and butter of pediatric ophthalmology. Um, they're safe and they're low risk. Um, not no risk, but then nothing is no risk. Um, and this is the standard practice in pediatric ophthalmology clinics. It's still the standard practice in my clinic and will always be a gold standard. But not just in children, adults too. The number of adults that I see that aren't um, wearing their refractive correction is, uh, is quite significant, actually. But in nystagmus, when you're never looking through the visual axis for long because the eye is constantly moving, and especially if you have a significant head posture, um, and you, you don't get a dampening effect from having something on the eye. So this then brings me to contact lenses. Now, it, it was first suggested over 40 years ago that contact lenses may cause a dampening of the nystagmus. Um, and many isolated cases and case series have suggested that refractive contact lenses can improve the vision and or the various parameters of the nystagmus waveform. There have been two published um, randomized trial Trials, one suggested no significant difference between specs, soft and hard contact lenses, and the other suggested trend towards improvement, but the improvement was small. So what we really do need is a larger definitive multi-center trial. In theory, I think it's completely logical and would make sense that a contact lens would provide a superior optical correction. Um, it's sitting on the eye, it's moving with the eye, um, and especially if you had a head posture, you're looking through the visual axis constantly. You don't get the same optical aberrations that you can with spectacles, particularly large refractive errors. And there may be a dampening effect of the contact lens on the eye. Not necessarily a visible dampening effect, but when we assess eye recordings, there, there seems to be a dampening effect. Contact lenses are also suitable in all age groups, um, unlike various medications, um, even in children and women of childbearing age. So um, we we fit contact lens in children post-cataract surgery. So children that have congenital cataracts, they have surgery very early on in life. Um, they have contact lens fitted below the age of two, three months. Um, so it is possible, but you do need to have a very good optometrist, um, a very, um, very, very good parents because you're going to take on most of the, um, most of the workload. 
but contact lenses have a slightly higher risk than glasses, um, the main one being microbial keratitis, which I'll discuss later on. So this is just an example of, you know, just stating the obvious. If you have a large head posture and you aren't necessarily going down a surgical route just yet, um, for whatever reason, um, and the, these aren't his glasses, by the way, these are my glasses <laughs> on, on him, but um, this, is, this will be the visual, the visual axis, um, if they were his glasses, and if he had a large head posture, he wouldn't be looking through the visual axis at all. And so it would make sense that if you have contact lenses, you're looking through the visual axis constantly. So I, I think it's logical. Yes. Glasses do sometimes help the head posture. Um, the problem is with such large, he large head postures, you're not looking through the center of the, um, of the, of the spectacles. Oh, yeah. Oh. And actually, for a child with such a large head posture, you may want to go down a surgical route as well, because then you can look. So part of the improvement is not just um, visual, but also you can look through the, uh, it's not just the moving in the null zone, but you can actually look through the center of your glasses. Um, so this, if this were, um, these are actually my sons a few years ago, but if this were a, a patient, then I would have a low threshold for doing optical plus surgical treatment because unless he wanted contact lenses, um, because he's not going to be looking through the visual axis a lot of the time. So um, as I said, in theory, contact lenses, when tolerated, will improve visual function, um, although we don't know what the best outcome measure is. If they're not tolerated, um, then the irritation will exacerbate the nystagmus. Um, and as I've said, probably a superior refractive correction plus an additional proprioceptive effect. Um, then there's the debate about whether you try soft or hard contact lenses. From a pediatric point of view, I prefer soft contact lenses um, just because they're better tolerated. Um, well, for many more reasons other than being better tolerated, but that's one of the main reasons. But the main downsides, contact lenses, as I said before, were infections, um, difficulties with fitting, so you do need to get see an optometrist that's comfortable with fitting um, a child or adult with nystagmus, um, and also you need to tolerate the contact lenses. Now, I am very pro-contact lenses, but I also see the other side of contact lenses occasionally, um, Less so in children with nystagmus just because of the proportion, but I obviously have do general ophthalmology as well. So microbial keratitis is the most significant risk with contact lenses. So if you're going to go down a contact lens route, you need to be very, very careful with lens hygiene. Um, and not just lens hygiene, also using tap water, swimming, no swimming contact lenses. The, the commonest... Um, contact lens infection is caused by pseudomonas, and pseudomonas is um, a common culprit is tap water. Um, so the normal tap water people wash their hands with, um, wash their face with. You may wash your hands, put the contact lens in with wet hands. Actually, don't, don't do that. Um, and many people don't realize that, but that's, that's increasing, your, increasing your risk of um, contact lens-related infection. So you do need to be um, a bit OCD or very OCD if you go down the contact lens route. This, do, this doesn't happen very commonly, <laughs> but because I've seen the other side of it um, from my, with my general ophthalmology hat on, you do need to bear this in mind. You do need to be very careful and only take on contact lenses, especially with children, if you're prepared to be um, OCD about managing the contact lenses with your children. Sorry, I had to, that's the downside to contact lenses. Um, in terms of the evidence, so the two trials so far are the, um, are the Leicester trial. So this was a randomized crossover trial where we compared spec score, they compared spec scores with soft contact lenses and rigid con um, hard contact lenses. There were 24 participants, 12 with idiopathic nystagmus and no other reason for the nystagmus and 12 associated with albinism. And there were no significant differences in any nystagmus parameter. In fact, there was a worsening of near vision in both groups despite a reduction in intensity. The study that we did was a pilot's randomized control trial, and I just looked at, um, it was really to plan a larger study, um, and I just looked at soft contact lenses, again, just because I, the main reason being I think they're better tolerated in younger children, and we looked at adult idiopaths to make the trial easier to, to do, minimize confounding factors. 
And we did find a small improvement in vision um, as well as waveform parameters, but the effect size was small. Um, so, I mean, essentially we do need a definitive larger multicenter trial to confirm or dispute. Um, so as much as I can say, well, I found this very helpful in many of my adults and children in clinic, we need the evidence to, to confirm that or dispute that, hopefully not. So that's against a baseline of spectacles um, and also comparing the fully corrective contact lenses, so the contact lens with prescription versus plain contact lenses to see whether it was just the prescription or whether it was the, the contact lens on the eye. I think the reason, I mean, I'm, I, must, I was a little bit disappointed we didn't get a bigger effect size um, because I'm a strong believer in contact lenses. And I think part of that is because um, we were looking at adults and the visual improvement in adults is going to be limited um, because you have a developed visual system. Um, we didn't have a lot of large refractive errors. We didn't have a lot of large head postures. So the patients, that the people that I've seen in clinic that have done really well in contact lenses tend to have the larger refractive errors, tend to have the larger head postures, um, tend to have much more marked nystagmus. But you know, only a larger definitive trial will confirm either way, and that's what we need to do, which we'll hopefully be doing as a multi-centered trial. Um, the other evidence that has been published has been in the form of case series and case reports, and the primary outcome has been visual acuity in the majority. The largest case series was um, published in 1989 with 112 patients with nystagmus, and they found that in those with corrective contact lenses, many had an improvement, and the contact lenses were well tolerated. Other studies showed an improvement in visual acuity in the majority, as well as both contrast and VFQ25 scores. VFQ25 is a quality of life questionnaire. And there was only one case of rebound phenomenon. So after trying hard contact lenses, um, the patient had oscillopsia symptoms where they saw everything move, but this settled. This is just a summary of the, of the papers. If anybody wants it, I can, <laughs> I can give it to you later on. I won't go through it and, and bore you. Um, so that's glasses and contact lenses, which I spent more time on because I think that is the most important part of um, optical intervention. The other optical interventions are, um, that have been looked at are biofeedback. So um, Bruce Evans published a study in 1998, and they looked at intermittent photic stimulation with after-image feedback, and they looked at 38 patients with nystagmus, and the main outcome measure was visual acuity and contrast sensitivity, but they found that the improvement in vision was more learning rather than treatment. Um, and then prisms. Um, so prisms we use to optimize the use of a null point, a null zone. Um, and essentially it moves, the prisms move the images rather than the eyes. The eyes moves when, move when the images have moved. Um, the commonest use for us anyway, and I know that we do things slightly different to the way you do things in, in the US, is assessing prior to surgery. Um, sometimes to try and, if you don't have access to eye recordings, to work out how much surgery to do. Um, but it's not ideal as a definitive treatment, except possibly a convergence null um, or a very small head posture where glasses, where surgery, surgical intervention isn't suitable. So they do have their place, but mostly it's, um, it's preoperatively. Fresnel prisms are um, the ones we use most commonly. They're temporary prisms, um, but they do degrade images because you see lots of little lines on the, on the sticky on prism. Um, if you do get them incorporated, you can only really do this with small prisms and not for large prisms for large head postures, um, but they are heavy and obvious, and you do get many more optical aberrations. And just so you know what a Fresnel prism looks like if you use it, um, this is Hillary Clinton, so probably the most famous person with a Fresnel prism on her spectacles. Um, a Fresnel prism is a sticky on prism that you stick on the posterior surface of your spectacles. Um, if you had the prism incorporated for a small head posture, then it wouldn't be visible to everyone. But as a short-term measure, they're often stuck on. So the evidence for prisms um, is essentially for moving the null zone. The first paper is um, for patients where they use the prisms to move the null zone with an improvement in vision. The second paper 
similar again for moving the null zone. The third paper actually used the prisms to move the null zone after um, head posture surgery. So the patients were left with a small head posture and they used the prisms for the residual head posture. Not suitable for a large head posture. Um, and the third treat, uh, the last treatment is porthole treatments. Now, this is not something that we advocate, but for the sake of completeness, when I did literature search, I thought I should include this. Um, I've, and when I was reading this, it always reminds me of a, a case that I saw as a very junior doctor, um, a child that had come from, um, from abroad, and the child was a very, very, very short-sighted, and they'd come in with um, black lenses with a hole in them, uh, basically a pinhole in the middle, and they had been using those to improve the child's vision um, rather than refraction, and Dad could not understand why we thought this was a really bizarre thing to do rather than um, get a pair of glasses. But essentially, um, in refractive error, as we've seen in the other photo, the, the beams of light are scattered and they aren't, um, they aren't all focused on the retina where they should be. In a pinhole, so when you go to clinic, you probably have your vision or your children have their vision measured um, with their glasses or if they wear them or contact lens if they wear them and then you'll have a little pinhole put up in front of you to see whether we can make the vision any better because the pinhole eliminates all of the um, all of these other beams of light and gives you a slightly clearer image in practice what it means that's that's often there's a refractive um, a refractive problem that hasn't been that hasn't been managed managed optimally um, whether it's just a refractive error, whether it's a media opacity, so there's something else that could give you a clearer image. So we don't advocate this as a treatment, um, but somebody did look at this in 1986. They looked at 38 children, um, but it's not something that we would advocate as a, a treatment. The last part of um, optical correction um, is low visual aids. Now, it's a blank slide because while I was sitting in the last talk, I thought, oh my goodness, I forgot to talk about low visual aids. Um, which is actually really important. Um, so I'm just going to talk to you about it and answer any questions you need me to answer later on. So it's really important, um, and although I forgot about it in this talk, I don't forget about it in the clinical setting, um, to be assessed from the low vision point of view. We know that the vision, your optimal vision, many, many children, adults have um, optimal vision, but when you're tired, when you're stressed, the vision's really variable. Um, and also at school, in schools and workplaces, because people often, many, um, many children and adults I see with nystagmus because I see more infantile nystagmus, they otherwise look completely normal apart from the eyes wobbling. People don't realize what a visual impairment they have. Um, and in fact, many children are often to told to stop misbehaving if they're adopting a head posture or if um, they're looking in the wrong direction to optimize the vision because people just don't, don't understand how, what an impact it has on the vision. So low visual aids are really important, um, and we always have um, once a year with our children and adults seen in the low visual aid clinic. In fact, we've set up a, a separate pediatric clinic, and the majority of, because I, I see lots of children with nystagmus, the majority of children in the clinic um, have nystagmus. And this is quite useful in terms of discussing how to optimize vision, so lighting, magnifiers. Um, I've actually picked up a lot of useful tips um, over the last few days uh, which I'll be passing on to my patients, even things like zooming in um, when, you're, when you're looking at a presentation, zooming in on your phone, and then you can zoom in further on your phone once you've taken a photo. So lots of little tips I've picked up over the last few days. Nowadays, um, at schools and in many workplaces, we often use um, iPads, um, PCs, um, so electronics. So it's much, in many ways, it's much easier to give yourself the visual or your children the visual support that you need without making it immediately obvious to everyone else. A big problem um, that we had previously. So when I started ophthalmology about 20 years ago, um, children with visual impairments had to have everything blown up and especially when you're at secondary school, um, but actually even, even as adults, it draws attention to you. Um, and there's a fine line be between getting the support that you need um, and actually not wanting to draw attention to yourself for, you know, for, for other reasons. So now it's, we, we do often push for this in schools and in workplaces. Um, children are able to you know, change their font size, change the contrast, 
to do whatever is easier for them. And it is much, children do find it much easier now. And parents have also noticed how much easier it is for children being able to adapt things if they can get the equipment and support they need at school, which we really do push quite hard for um, without drawing attention to themselves. So sorry I didn't put a proper, <laughs> proper bit in that talk, but it is really important. Um, so I'm also going to discuss pharmacological treatments very briefly um, because I wanted the talk to focus more on optical treatments. Now, pharmacological treatments are, there are a lot of pharmacological treatments. Um, I was thinking about what would define, what would make up a perfect drug. So a perfect drug for nystagmus would need to reduce or eliminate the oscillation with few or no systemic side effects would have to have no long-term adverse effects because you need lifelong therapy, have no teratogenic effects that you can use them in women of childbearing age, um, and be cheap because you need to use them over your whole lifetime. But is there such a thing? I don't think there is such a thing for any condition, to be honest. There's a long list of medications, and this is just a few of the medications that can be used in, um, in nystagmus. But when you get such a long list, you know there's no such thing as a perfect drug or a one-size-fits-all. Um, and to be honest, in children, I'm also reluctant to use medication. So the medication, I, when I do use medication, tends to be in older children um, and adults just because of the potential adverse effects. So I'm not going to talk about all of them. I'm just going to talk about briefly about the ones that I use most commonly. So brinzolamide eye drops is the easy, low-risk one. Um, gabapentin is the, the most commonly used one um, in my clinic at least. And botulinum toxin overall is probably the less commonly used one, but we do use it a lot um, in the UK, not just for nystagmus, but for other indications. Um, and I suppose it crosses between med medical treatments and surgical treatment is somewhere in between. But I thought I'd mention it just to make the talk a little bit different. So brinzolamide is a um, topical, is a drop. Um, it's a cup carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, and it's actually used as lifelong treatment in patients with high-risk ocular hypertension and glaucoma. It has few systemic side effects, and it's generally well tolerated. We have a big pediatric glaucoma service at, um, at Moorfields, and we looked at all of the children on, um, on Azopt, um, and there weren't any that had any, any significant adverse effects over the last, over the last few years. Um, so it's a fairly safe drop. There isn't a lot of evidence for it just yet. Um, I could find four studies so far. Um, we're trying to, we're going through the data that we've used in adult, where I've used the Azopt in adults. Um, but the first two papers were actually published on the same patient. A patient was given the oral form of this drop, um, and then the second paper published was the topical form and had similar effects and improvement in visual function. The next paper was from Hertel's group. And they looked at five adults, um, and this paper suggested an improvement in both vision and nystagmus. But the last paper published was published in 2017, and it showed vari variable effects on the nystagmus. So the question is still unanswered, um, even though it would be really exciting to have a drop that we can use for nystagmus. Now, I've just put an example here of um, one of my adult patients that I used um, Azopt on. This is actually the first patient I used Azopt on. And... This lady had infantile nystagmus and early onset squint. She was one of the patients in my contact lens trial who actually couldn't put the contact lenses in. Um, so we gone over the different treatment options and she decided to try brinzolamide and she was over the moon after trialing brinzolamide, um, even though she only had a vision improvement of one line. And when I, um, when I did her eye movement recordings, I could see why she was over the moon um, because although the vision had only improved one line because of this dampening of the nystagmus here, what she was over the moon about was that her nystagmus was far less obvious. Now, I had brought her in for, for a few baselines um, because the first time I met her, she was very anxious and she was very upset. Uh, so we know that that does have an effect on the, um, on the nystagmus baseline, but this was her best... I think we had three recordings of her beforehand. This was her best pre-op recording. So part of that will, part of the improvement will be the drops, but part may be that she was trying a bit of a placebo effect, possibly that she was trying something. Anyway, the combination um, worked well for her. But 
before everybody gets ex too excited about this, this was one of my first. This was my first case, and it was one of my two best cases. So not everybody has this dramatic effect. So I obviously I presented the best case, but I found um, and see so we will we will be we are writing this up, but about one in four of my adult patients notice a change um, in their vision, um, and the changes are small, um, but from my point of view and from their point of view, it's low risk. So it's worth a try. If you do have an improvement with the drops, then it's something that you can continue long-term safely. And if you don't, then you've lost very little. But yeah, this is my best case, so it doesn't work this well in everybody else. Um, gabapentin, there've been, there's been lots of um, cases, case series, retrospective and prospective notes, re note reviews. It's probably the most commonly used drug in, um, in nystagmus. Um, another Leicester trial, was a, an RCT looking at gabapentin and memantine, and this is the one that we often quote to patients. There was a significant improvement in vision between the groups, as well as an established intensity and foveation and a subjective improvement in all. The downside to the gabapentin is that it does need to be taken up to four times a day. Um, it can make people feel quite, quite tired, quite drowsy, quite lightheaded. Um, and, but I have found it to be the most, effect, the most effective treatment um, in terms of the systemic medications. In the UK, it's also now a controlled drug, so not quite as easy to prescribe as it used to be as of April 2019, but I'm not sure if that's the case here. It's, it's reasonably easy to access and reasonably safe. Now, the last part of pharmacological assay is somewhere between pharmacological and surgical. Um, it's botulinum toxin. Now, I thought I should mention this because it's a little bit different and also because we have such a big toxin service at Moorfields. Um, and it's not just for, for people with nystagmus. We use it more for strabismus than nystagmus. So Botox is a thing that people inject for their wrinkles for temporary weakening of the, of the muscles. We give it to the extraocular muscles. Um, the downside is that it has temporary effects, but that's also the plus side if you want to simulate the effects of surgery. Um, and it works by inhibiting the release of acetylcholine in, into the synaptic cleft, if anybody's interested. <laughs> so the commonest uses that we, uh, commonest reasons we use it for is in the extraocular muscles for strabismus. In our clinic, and so we know that strabismus is more common in the sagmus, so there is an overlap. In our clinic, patients that have had surgery, uh, a lot of surgery, they aren't suitable for further surgery for whatever reason. They don't want further surgery. They have small squints. There are many reasons that um, people aren't suitable for further surgery. They can have toxin as a long-term treatment option. It has been used as a retrobulbar injection, so injecting behind the eye, but this is only for acquired nystagmus, not infantile nystagmus, I should stress. So we don't do this very often, um, but you do need to repeat the injections um, every three to six months. Some people, less, less than that, some people need um, them once a year. A droopy eyelid is a, common is a common adverse effect, but we do hold the needle in the muscle in place for 35 seconds to reduce the risk of leakage. Unlike surgery, we can't taper the amount of toxin to the size of the squint or the head posture. And in patients who have a retrobulbar injection, you can get worse than the stagmus in the other eye. And you also need to bear in mind that although it's a low risk procedure, you have repeated risks of each time you inject, there's risks to the injection, including significant hemorrhage, infection, retinal problems. The risks are small, but I say nothing is risk-free, but you just do need to be aware of that. So in nystagmus, um, in nystagmus we use it for all the same indications as strabismus, so all the non-nystagmus indications, but the main additional reasons I use it are, is, are to simulate the effects of head posture surgery. So if parents aren't sure or adults aren't sure whether they want to proceed or they want to, you know, they want to see what it, what it will be like, um, then I will give toxin to the, the two muscles I would have weakened surgically to give them an idea of what to expect, um, but not as a regular thing, as a one-off thing. Um, if they are happy with that, we'll wait for the toxin to wear off and we go down a surgical route. Or the patients that do have it um, regularly, those without, stri without stri strabismus, are those who've had head postures um, and have had previous surgery and aren't suitable for further surgery because we can't move the, weaken the muscles anymore. Um, those patients can have, those adults can have um, toxin repeated every six months to maintain the head posture. 
And in terms of what we do, the principles are exactly the same as, um, as with surgery. If you have a left face turn to use right gaze, we weaken the right outside muscle and the left inside muscle, which is what we would do surgically, or at least it's what we would do surgically in the UK. I think things are a little bit different over here. Um, and if you have a chin-up head posture, um, you can weaken the two, the two lower muscles. You can't use it to simulate the effects of surgery with a chin down head posture because if you inject the two top muscles, then your eyelids will droop completely and it will defeat the purpose and you'll be very, very unhappy. Um, this is a case, and this is not something that I would advocate for people that don't use tops very often or without a very, very, very well-informed patient, um, but the recordings were quite nice, so I put it in as an, an, a good example. Um, this is an adult of mine who actually had acquired periodic alternating nystagmus, so she had an alternating, uh, had two null points. The treatments for this would be, well, optical doesn't necessarily work so well with this. She had tried medical treatment, but um, the only thing that worked for her was a huge dose of baclofen, um, but she was, she was wanting to get married and start a family, so didn't want to be on medication. So I offered her surgery um, and then discussed toxin as well, even though I thought the answer would be no because I would be required to inject all four muscles and it takes a very good patient to tolerate that. But she was very sensible but she, and she wanted to trial toxin to simulate the effects of surgery. So this was her before the, the top recording is for her before the, before the botulinum toxin injection um, and so I gave botulinum toxin into all four horizontal recti, which is what we would have done surgically. We would have weakened four horizontal rectus muscles. Um, and she had a really good improvement following the botulinum toxin. So this is a really good example of how it can simulate the effects of surgery. I had told her I wasn't going to repeat these injections every, um, every six months because that would be you know, the risk of four injections every six months. And she's now had surgical intervention and the, um, the post-surgical eye recordings are almost identical to these post-toxin. But just to stress, it's not a regular treatment if, the patient, if you're suitable for surgery, but it can simulate the effects of surgery. So finally, my, my last slide, this is just my protocol for treatment, um, which may differ from everybody else's. It's a very simplified slide and um, not a particularly fancy slide, but, and this is treatment, not management. Management, um, for me, would, in, would involve investigating for other reasons for nystagmus before we go down the treatment route or alongside the treatment route. So right at the top is the optical treatment, refractive correction in all. You can't, I don't think you can assess and manage a child or adult with nystagmus without assessing the refraction. Spectacles and contact lenses, single most important part of the treatment. And in children, amblyopia therapy, so management of the lazy eye. After that, then go on to the other more fancy treatments. Um, so if there's a clinically utilized null, you can either go down um, a medical or a surgical treatment route. If there isn't a clinical utilized null, then I, I go down the medical. I don't, um, I don't go down the surgical, even though um, you'll hear surgical talks later on discussing. Um, but I'm British and I like to minimize risk, so I tend to do the more conservative treatments. So. Medical treatments, my first line of treatment, I will discuss the evidence available for each, um, for each treatment and allow patients to make their decision, but we'll often try trial ASOPT in the first instance, and if there's an improvement, then great, we'll continue. If there isn't, which there isn't in the majority, um, we'll then discuss systemic treatments, gabapentin commonly, baclofen, memantine. If there is clinically utilized null, you can go down either route. So, Prisms, as I um, discussed earlier, can be used for small head postures, convergence nulls, all to simulate the effects of surgery or planned surgery. Botulinum toxin is more for surgical planning or people who have had um, surgery previously not suitable for further surgery. Or, say, I, as, a, as a, a squint surgeon as well, I had to mention surgical intervention somewhere or surgical intervention, which could be either in the form of squint surgery, moving the null, um, so head posture surgery or dampening the nystagmus overall, as you would, for example, in a period of alternating nystagmus where they have an alternating null. Okay, yep. What, what do you consider a small head posture? Like, 
Yeah, it does, it does vary. Patients won't, people won't. Oh, so what do we consider a small, a small head turn? So that will vary depending on your, your ophthalmologist. For, for your, what for you my, look at, for the prism or this or that, what are you So less than 15 to 20 degrees, I'd consider a, a small head, head posture. Um, prisms much more than that aren't really well tolerated. And for verticals, they really, such a big, prism won't be tolerated at all. But the things with head postures, um, many people manage fairly well with a small, small head posture, and I won't necessarily rush into surgery um, just because, you know, if you're, if you, if you're managing well visually, um, then you don't necessarily need to move that, um, at, that at that time. But for, a, for example, a very large head posture, where you aren't looking, you're nowhere near the visual axis of your glasses, um, you're struggling at school, you're getting um, you know, two or three lines of improvement just with t turning your head or um, that's, that's significant. So there isn't a, there isn't, it varies, it varies depending on the individual because it also depends on the visual, the visual improvement, whether it's a vertical, whether it's a tilt, um, and whether it's a horizontal. Horizontals are obviously better tolerated, um, but it does vary depending on your on your ophthalmologist and yes. You mentioned the relationship between uh, wearing glasses and the absence of tilting. So refractive correction can the so not the absence of tilting. The refractive correction can sometimes improve the head posture a little. Smaller head postures. It's not going to turn this into this. No, I'm not suggesting that at all. Um, but a visual improvement can sometimes improve a head posture a little. Well, why is, I'm curious why that is, because we've observed that, and I wonder how that happens. So the, you're using the, people are using the, the head postures to give them better vision, and if, you, if your vision is improved optically, then you won't need such a marked <coughs> head posture, is my logical reasoning behind it. But I say you won't you won't go from this to this or this to this. But if you if you have a smaller head posture and your vision is improved, then you don't need to adopt that head posture as much. I miss anyone? Yes. It depends on the refractive error. So not all children have a refractive error. Um, and so obviously without a refractive error, you can't give glasses or, or contact lenses. I wouldn't advocate Plano contact lenses for children without a refractive error because obviously you're undertaking the risk um, and I, I wouldn't suggest that to, to children. Um, it depends on how big the refractive error is. It depends on when they're given their glasses. The earlier they're in glasses, the better. Um, I found that probably because of the, the way the vision develops, which is why I stressed on that, in children with very large refractive errors, if they aren't managed by, if they aren't, haven't received anything at all by maybe five or six, they even without nystagmus, they don't necessarily reach their full visual potential. But if you can get children into glasses early, if their vision isn't improving with the glasses, um, then you will want to look into other reasons for the, nystagm for the nystagmus. But because we do things slightly differently, we look for other reasons before, before that point. So we won't wait until the vision is imp isn't improving before we look for other reasons. When we see a child we'll take a, or an adult, because from adults I start from scratch as well because things have changed a lot in the last 20 years and you know, I'm often giving people new diagnoses as adults. So you'll start from the history, the examination, um, and then your investigations is appropriate, so OCTs, um, electrodiagnostic tests, very rarely MR in, in children, infantile nystagmus, very rarely MRIs, um, but most reasons for nystagmus are optical. So if the vision isn't improving, despite good compliance, then you would be thinking of other causes if you haven't already been investigated. Um, but then you do need to really push for, uh, for compliance, and I know that's easier said than done, especially if you're trying to get a two, three-year-old but there are ways of improving compliance in children. You know, rewards, um, parents wearing glasses. We have play therapy as well, so the, the children I really, really can't get into glasses. 
we have a play therapist and I'll bring them in for a week um, and they'll come in every day and sit with a play therapist. So there are many things that you can do, but it's really important. But if they don't improve, then I, they may not be wearing the glasses. Um, you may not have given them enough time. Um, so I do also have some people that come into clinic, some parents that have come into clinic and they've said, no, my child's been wearing the glasses all the time. And the child said, well, no, I haven't. <laughs> I haven't worn them for ages. You just gave them to me this morning. <laughs> So, you know, compliance is really, really important. I, I can't say, because I'm from a pediatric ophthalmology background, I can't stress that enough. But if you have another abnormality associated with an astagmus, then you're not going to get that same improvement in vision. There are lots of, lots of other reasons. Yeah, vision therapy is not something that we necessarily use or advocate, uh, and it's probably used more in Europe. I'm, I'm not sure what the evidence is for it, or if there is evidence for it. I don't know if anyone has any, um, but I don't, I don't think there's any solid evidence for it, so we don't, um, we don't advocate it. It is used quite a lot in Europe, um, but I don't think it helps a great deal. Um, it tends not to work very well. Um, not tends not to work very well. There was another study which I f I hadn't put in here, but the improvements tend to be more in, um, learning effects um, rather than the actual biofeedback working well, or at least that's what the evidence would suggest. Questions? Any questions? Well, thank you very much for that uh, informative talk. <laughs> and on behalf of ANN and everybody here, I have a small token of appreciation oh, for coming and speaking to us. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.